Hello. Um, OK, so where to begin? So one of my absolute favorite books when I was a kid um, was David Macaulay's The Way Things Work. Um, I, was, I was truly obsessed with this book, actually. Um, but anyone who maybe was born a little too late, so maybe, let's say, after the mid, late, mid to late 90s, basically it was a book where it would go through all the everyday technologies um, that you just see around you in your home, at school or whatever. And it would provide these kind of like cut through views so you can kind of see how everything worked inside. Um, and actually it wasn't just a book, it became a CD-ROM as they were called in those days, which was like the coolest thing ever for me. Cause I, could, I would literally spend hours and hours um, on the family kind of computer with this thing playing and just clicking on absolutely everything, um, all the different kind of like tech, so things like telephones and photocopiers and shavers. Um, and then you kind of find yourself often going down into this like engineering wormhole where like you'd find like yourself being introduced to like basic principles of like physics. Um, it, was, it was actually, yeah, as I said, it was one of those really, th one of those really fun things that I, I and in fact, when I found the, this video um, of some of the clips online, like I literally had one of those like nostalgia kicks that, I mean, it, like hurts in the solar plexus. Because um, basically what it was, um, was a way in. And that was something that as a kid was always really special to me. It was a way into thinking how things worked. Um, how the things that, you know, were hidden away, the things that often adults weren't very good at explaining, how those things actually worked. And there was this hilarious, cute um, mammoth avatar who'd go around doing quite silly things. And kind of that always, <clears throat> that always made it kind of fun as well. So kind of what I was thinking when I was rem reminding myself about kind of the way things work, it sort of hit me how it's, it often feels quite interesting now as an adult that kind of we're in this interesting space where clarity, um, well, shall we say, is scarce. Um, it's kind of, it's very different these days. It's often really quite difficult to get anything that really gives a sense of the way things actually work, which is um, kind of ironic given how um, deeply complicated and interconnected everything that we're now so reliant on actually is. So, um, maybe just, go back into like who I am and why I'm here talking. Um, so yes, my name is Florence Okoya. Um, I am a user experience designer um, and a semi-professional dilettante. Um, and in the context of this talk, uh, the main thing to remember that about me is the fact that I guess, much like seven-year-old Florence, I've never stopped being fascinated by the way things work with actually seeing what is under the hood of everything and anything around me. Um, oh yeah, also some content warning for the next screen, it's a bit um, busy. One of the things that I'm particularly curious about um, when it comes to design um, is because in a sense, as we are the machinery that kind of creates the future, um, that intentionally creates the future, um, I'm particularly interested in the way it is that we work, right? Um, and also, I also want to kind of give a kind of an caveat or like explanation. I guess by designer, really, I'm talking in the broadest possible sense. I'm talking about anyone whose role it is to specifically and deliberately move things from a particular state of being into another state. So I, of course, I'm not just talking about other user experience designers or service designers. I'm as much talking about BAs. I'm as much talking about solution architects. I'm as much talking about backend um, and network infrastructure engineers. Um, all of us, our purpose, our trade, is to create, uh, to create the future. And so if we care about the future that we're creating, um, I think it's kind of pretty important to also think about the dynamics of this creation. After all, how we, how we work is absolutely crucial to understand why we are making the stuff that we are making. And what is it that we're making? Well, um, to be fair, I think it's safe to say it's a bit of a mess, to be honest. Just between us in this space, you don't have to pretend to cater to LinkedIn. 
I think it's pretty much safe to say that we all know that on some level we are still making a bunch of pretty exclusionary, exploitative crap, which is still fairly dependent on environmentally destructive infrastructure and economic paradigms. We are in a bit of a mess. And alas, life isn't like a power drill or a vacuum cleaner. Things are complex. Design is complex. And sometimes it can be very easy to wish that one could just burn it all down. But that would hurt a lot of people. So we won't. Maybe, maybe there's a way of dealing with this complexity. Um, maybe there's a way of dealing with all these difficulties and entanglements that our community faces, um, that our ways of working create. And obviously, I would answer, yes, there probably is. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Um, I do think there is something that we can take from the way things work approach, that, that idea of breaking things down into their constituent components. And I think I can say that because, and again, sorry, warnings for this slide, some animations, because although on the outside, complex systems can seem wildly unpredictable um, and quite unwieldy with a great deal of internal feedback loops that kind of create these emergent properties which actually can't really be broken down simply as the sum of their parts. They are usually, however, generally speaking, they are usually created by actually quite basic parts, basic, very simple components, each of which are obeying quite simple laws. Um, and this is something that's, again, one of, those, one of the most brilliant discoveries, I think, of the second half of the 20th century in theoretical physics, this idea that actually from the very simple can emerge the irreducibly complex. So in light of this complexity, um, how can we use its features against it, so to speak? How can we use its characteristics to help us design better, given that we are also designing um, for other ever-evolving complex systems. And obviously, perhaps I should go back a bit and say, what do I actually mean by designing better? Well, ultimately, when I talk about designing better, um, and this is just simply a basic axiom, you may argue with it if you wish. I don't think you should, but you may. Um, what I mean is ultimately designing to empower people, to educate people, to reveal to people. I mean, designing holistically for our current ecosystem and for the generations to come. I mean, designing as a collective to ensure that uh, we have a culture that's growing, that's being nourished, and is also more accountable um, because it has a rooted history. I'm talking about designing to create um, a culture rather than rock stars. And let's be real, I mean, given half the discourse on design Twitter, most of these rock stars get very old and grumpy quite quickly. So we're probably doing them a favor. Ultimately, I'm talking about designing for advocacy um, rather than inclusion. So, so now we've come to why I'm kind of even here giving this talk. So in a way, this is almost like a quasi-research paper, in a sense. Um, as some folks will know, who I've been chatting with, in, uh, chatting with for the past couple of months, this is actually a talk that's given me quite a lot of like um, thinkage, shall we say. I've actually really struggled with this because I often quite like being able to present something back, almost like a kind of an answer or something approaching a solution. And really, all I have to give back to you, my fellow designers, um, is sort of halfway research, as it were, things that have been tried out, things that have some interesting hints, but perhaps nothing absolutely concrete. So you'll have to bear with me, um, and I'm sure over the course of this evening we'll have more discussions. And that's something that I, I truly desperately want, actually, rather than simply me being here trying to impart whatever wisdom I think I might have. So over the past couple of months, what um, I've been doing is kind of experimenting with various frameworks that um, could potentially help us as designers um, to sort of break down the systems that we're working with into their constituent parts and then to better understand how they interact with each other. Uh, most of these experiments, as it were, have been done as workshops, kind of at other um, either festivals or talks or conferences or, um, or academic kind of events. Um, and they've been done always with other designers, whether they're service designers, graphic designers, user experience designers, whatever. Um, some of them are to do, um, that I do, kind of more related to my day job, and others are more to do with other various projects. 
And ultimately, what, what they kind of can be broken down into is kind of a very basic sort of three-step process, right? Um, so ultimately, they consist of clarifying who is part of the system, um, clarifying what one's values are, um, whether kind of radical, real or speculative, and mapping out what those values or what those goals would mean for each of those people or each of those kind of departments or actors within the system who we've identified. And obviously, I'm happy to say that there's nothing particularly radical. Um, I mean, I would say it's interesting, but some people might say there's nothing particularly interesting about this. Um, in many ways, this process, this way of working is, for those of us who are service designers, it's service design 101, quite frankly. Um, but what's, what I found really interesting from these um, workshops with other designers is that there does seem to be still this really interesting kind of power from taking such a simple approach, which I like to think makes sense, given what I've just said about how complexity arises. If complexity can arise from very simple properties and very simple behaviours, um, perhaps actually... Um, taking quite simple approaches to understand, to breaking it down um, can give us some insight. However, I think, there's, I think also the process has revealed something in itself. So, for example, the diff what's key about the first step is that the who um, always goes beyond the immediate design team. That's something I'm, I'm always very clear and firm about. It could include, for example, the marketing team and finance. It could include, depending on how your company is structured, it could include IT, it could include HR. Because ultimately, they are the ones who enable certain processes to happen in a particular way, which ultimately impact the way designers can design. For step two, there are various methods we can use to clarify what your values, either what they really are in the business or in the context in which you're working with, or the values that you want to achieve. So you can, there's plenty of like uh, methodologies from speculative and critical design theory. And um, what's really important though, is to avoid mixing up the real and the speculative, um, which can lead to some discomfort when you realize that the speculative isn't, is quite, um, far away from the real, shall we say, but that's really important, otherwise um, genuine chaos um, arises when you start mixing up those two types of values. Altogether, what this means is that one can more easily see the contradictions in the system, or at least that's certainly what seemed to arise from kind of these series of experiments. And one can get a deeper dimension to the requirements. So, for example, um, if, say, you know, when you're mapping out your different values, you map out, say, sustainability, um, and one of the actors in your system is the consumer, perhaps the user, it may well be that when you're trying to map what that value means for that particular actor, you come up with nothing, because the product that you've created, say, isn't something that actually can be recycled by your everyday consumer. And so then what that can do, that creates like a feedback loop to yourself as a designer because it says, okay, this is actually a new requirement for the product. Um, it can't be recycled by someone who buys it. So, th so therefore, me as a product designer has to design as part of this product a process by which it can be essentially returned so that we can take care of the recycling. Ultimately, I guess what you kind of end up with um, when you kind of follow this process is what I might call a very simple, the way things work, a TWT, that sounds quite cool, diagram. Um, and actually, it was really interesting, again, through this kind of process, that what turned out was that it did help clarify for people who were used to thinking about the systems they were working with as quite complicated and almost insurmountable, it did seem to provide some genuine clarity in understanding what is actually creating the system um, and, the ki and who is working with what and who depends on, on what other aspects of the system to work. And this is lovely, right? This is very gratifying as a researcher. Anyone who's a researcher will know it's always very lovely when things kind of turn out um, kind of approximately to something that you were hoping for. However, whilst the main aim of this work was as much to um, think about how we can sort of understand the complexity that we're all facing with, the complexity which in many ways inhibits us from working in, uh, to, to design better, as I said, designing for advocacy rather than inclusion. One of the things that I was particularly interested about in was actually getting feedback um, 
in, uh, about the messiness, like qualitative feedback, um, the detritus of discussion and thinkage that doesn't always get put down to paper because it's not something that one can easily sum up. And I was particularly interested in the contradictions, the things that were revealed to be insurmountable and almost too knotty to really get into, into in the spaces that we're working with, um, <clears throat> so in the time that we were given. But it was really interesting, actually, and in some ways quite sad. Um, and I will say sad, actually, because I think it's interesting for a community that talks a lot about communication, how rarely we seem to give each other the space to actually communicate how we feel. And it was very quite, and it was genuinely actually quite touching to hear other designers, many, some of whom I, you know, genuinely respect and I think they do, you know, amazing work, to come, to come back and say, well, this process has given us some clarity, and yet we're stuck with questions like this, like how can we design ever, really, in a system that requires people to want what they don't want? I think we're used to this idea that capitalism forces people to want things they don't need. But I think there's something really insidious about our kind of late-stage capitalism, wherein it can actually make you want things that, to be honest, you don't even want, yet alone the things that you, that you don't even need. Other questions, like how can one actually design in a context where projects are being done on the basis of budget rather than human needs? What on earth does any of this nonsense about inclusive design, designing with empathy, design thinking, what does that mean when one cannot design according to people's actual needs, when is only designing according to what someone assumes the market thinks will sell. And then sometimes how can one design with communities, quite frankly, who don't trust you? Earlier we heard about kind of um, technological colonialism. As someone who's like a native of London and lived in, then lived in Manchester for a long time, I always have a very, very difficult relationship with a lot of tech companies and startups because actually I've seen how they literally colonise the spaces which I grew up in. They raise up the prices so that even people like myself who are born in London cannot afford to live there, quite frankly. We heard earlier talking about that gap um, of essentially the lack of respect, quite frankly, for disabled people by those of us, by, by the design community. These are all examples of how our community, our infrastructure, our ways of working have made it almost impossible for us to work effectively. How can I dare to go and ask my local LGBTQ or advocacy or refugee group to come along and test something when actually I am probably part of the reason why they are in the situation, in, the, in the, the power dynamics that they currently are in. How can we design with communities that don't trust us? And now speaking solely from a user experience perspective, although I suspect that there's many commonalities with other design fields, I often thought that what these questions exemplified was actually what happens when the, when the radical, when the truly radical gets co-opted for profit. The tensions aren't just ideological, it's not just about selling out or not being cool. They result in tangibly incoherent practices and products which are made all the worse because, I mean, not only are they badly done, but then they make people who use them complicit in the badness just because they have the audacity to try to be human, to try to survive, to try to do a job, to try to pay their bills, to try to have friends. I often think about the way some of our communities still have the gall to talk about filter bubbles when it comes to social media, when really we are the ones who broke the contract with the people who use the platforms that we design. Many of our methods, the design process, rituals, and best practices, were actually first created and originated within a very particular ideological framework to empower workers, users, and consumers alike, not just to be inclusively exploitative. And I'm not sure how, but I suspect that this tension um, is, is, is something that can potentially be dealt with by advocating not simply for others, for the other, for the user, um, for the worker, for the world, but I suspect it might also start with advocating 
for ourselves. So this is where I'm going to go off piece a little bit. I mean, I kind of already have gone a little bit off piece, um, but so bear with me. Um, but basically, no one can really make change by themselves. Um, the machinery is too big. There is a need for us to work collectively, um, to pool our skills and resources, to watch out for and take care of each other. Um, and I always try to, and I, I always feel whenever I'm giving these design talks, I have to be very blunt. Like I'm, I'm genuinely not talking euphemistically. I'm not talking like I'm not, this isn't about empathy or feeling. I really mean pool our resources together. Like if you see another designer online struggling, um, actually offer them your tools. Like why not? It's that, I'm really talking on that kind of level. And I think it's really, really important if we're thinking about the context that we are currently in. Um, so, for example, we're now in a point in time in the UK where local councils are already experimenting with, if not outright using, surveillance technologies that have little transparency over where the data set is coming from, how it's been trained, um, and where the accountability is when it ultimately is revealed to be the racist trash that we all know this stuff actually is. We've had academics saying this now for, for a very long time. Um, and so, but where are we? Where are we? Um, who is speaking out? Um, and who needs the community to have their back? Because this, this is the other thing, right? An individual can't just be expected to speak out in whatever context they are, that they are in. They cannot be expected to speak up alone if they do not have the rest of the community to stick up for them. So who are these people? And, and are we as a community actually able to and ready to fight for each other, to advocate for each other? Right now, there are incubator and tech hubs filled with bright-eyed and bushy-tailed startups which are hard at work making yet more electronic tat made from the usual non-recyclable components created in exploitative working environments, no doubt employing the usual uh, assortment of vulnerability-riddled protocols. Where are we? Who is speaking up? Who needs to be protected? Who needs to be defended in order, quite frankly, to stop this? At the heart of any oppressive structure is an unseeing, which is often far more deliberate than not. So whilst through this process of kind of, of these workshops and developing the, these frameworks, whilst on a local level, I do find it interesting, and as I said, quite gratifying, that one of the first ways to design better for advocacy, not for inclusion, is by using simple techniques that elicit an intentional honesty about the way our systems work, about who is dependent on what and why, which counters the guff of our everyday practice. Whilst I think it's quite gratifying that that can work, um, at least to kind of to create, to reveal the structures, to reveal the systems, I think the next step is one in which we really have to push back on the individualist self-aggrandizing nonsense that plagues our community. So, as I said, as I'm, I'm really not being euphemistic, join a union, start a union, um, like just look out for each other. After all, a collective futurity is one where those who have advocate for those who don't. And I can tell you that it is bloody hard to advocate for others if you can't even advocate for yourself. Thank you.